So let me get started and sure. introduce you. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I know we've got a tur good turnout here. Hey, quiet down in the audience there. We've got a good turnout here um, at the University of Illinois, and I think we've got a, quite a few people online today as well. Uh, this is the TCIPG uh, uh, seminar series on uh, <coughs> resilient power grids, and we're really happy to have a representative from uh, an NSF, another NSF center, uh, that works on uh, power grids uh, here today. But before I introduce him, I want to just make one uh, quick announcement. I wanted to announce for industry and government people who may be online, I believe you probably already received an invitation and we've received a very good response so far. But just a reminder that our TCIPG annual industry government workshop uh, will be hold, held in November 7th and 8th. and. Uh, <laughs> There is still time to register, but we would appreciate if you register soon if you would like to come. Uh, and uh, we look forward to having a, a, a very interesting program. There'll be about a half day in which you'll learn about what's going on in our center, and then a full day uh, in which you uh, there's a series of panels that address some issues uh, that you can see if you go to the website. So this is our... Uh, announcement on the public website. If you have not received uh, an invitation and you would like to come, contact Sherry Hell Regal at the email address on the screen now and at the website, and Sherry can uh, send you an invitation. Okay, with that brief announcement, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is uh, Arani, uh, well, now I'm never going to get the Arania. Arania Chakraborty, he'll pronounce his name correctly. Uh, he's a assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering department at NC State in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, before joining NC State, he was an assistant professor at Texas Tech University. And before that, he was a postdoc um, at NASA and at the University of Washington, Seattle. NASA? Hmm? I was never with NASA. No? Oh, I'm sorry. I got that wrong. Boy, I'm really doing bad today. I really apologize. That's okay. At the Aeronautics and Astronautics, Astronautics Department. Department at the University of Washington, Seattle. He received his PhD in electrical engineering uh, from RPI in 2008, and his research interests are in power system dynamics and control uh, and using uh, emerging technologies such as wide area measurement systems. And in fact, that's going to be the talk uh, topic of his talk today. And if I can bring up his presentation for him, uh, then, then uh, I'll hand over. So we'd like to give you a warm welcome, and thanks for coming and spending the time day with us today and giving this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. You know, thanks very much for the nice introduction. And I guess uh, my sincere thanks to Rakesh for uh, inviting me for this nice seminar. Uh, this is my first time in Illinois, actually, even in the state of Illinois. So you know, I'm uh, enjoying my first visit and meeting a lot of people. Uh, I have quite a few friends in this department. And you know, I'm uh, really glad to connect back with them. So as uh, Bill mentioned, you know, so uh, let me just introduce myself one more time just for the sake of pronouncing my name correctly. Uh, my name is uh, Aranya Chakrabodhi. I'm an assistant professor at NC State. Uh, I, uh, I come from a sort of control theoretic background, and I've been working on applying different uh, uh, you know, ramifications of control theory uh, in the context of large-scale power systems, dynamics, and control. Uh, some of the keywords of my research are uh, model identification, model reduction, uh, data analysis of power systems, and you know designing distributed controllers for damping control of power system dynamics and uh, and things like that. Uh, and the technology, as Bill mentioned, you know the technology as I, which I which I use for applying uh, the different branches of control for power system applications is the wide area. Uh, phase measurement technology, which actually, you know, which has been emerging with lots of boom over the last uh, over the last decade, I would say, since the 2003 blackout happened. So today, I'm going to give a basically an overview of some of the things that, which I've been doing for the last couple of years, and which some of the things which I'm doing currently, uh, some of the uh, new lines of research where uh, things are going in my group. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to you know stop me and ask questions. 
So let me just, uh, this is a historical slide, you know, I mean, I, this happened a couple of years ago, but I still wanted to keep this slide just as a means of setting up the, the root cause of where this whole line of research actually started from. Uh, so as you know that, again, you know, I'm not going to define what wide area measurements are and, you know, how this technology kind of started emerging with so much of enthusiasm over the last couple of years in the power and other communities, for example. But we all know that the major motivation of why the WAMPs actually came back after being, you know, it was discovered back in the uh, early 80s by Jim Tharp and uh, Arun Fatki from Virginia Tech. But the reason why there was a resurgence of this technology was basically this landmark event of the 2003 Northeast blackout. And uh, after the 2003 Northeast blackout, you know, again, these are some historical facts, but, uh, but uh, I think they are very important to understand how the research perspective of this technology actually kind of started, uh, uh, started developing. So after the 2003 blackout, uh, the Department of Energy from the Eastern Interconnection Phaser Project, or you know, it's abbreviated as EIPP, uh, to, uh, to form basically a panel of experts to to delve into uh, you know to have some insight about why the blackout happened and what were the what were the main factors behind the blackout and things like that but then soon they realized that Although the blackout really happened in the Eastern Interconnect, you know, it was mainly in the Ohio region and it propagated uh, by cascading failures and all the things that you guys do probably to the, uh, to the ISO New England region. Uh, but uh, soon they realized that because of the interconnected nature of the, of the whole United States, you know, so it's not just enough to look only at local regions of the eastern interconnection or in just local regions of the eastern side of the interconnection. What you have to do is basically form a holistic idea of the entire interconnection taken together. And as a result of which, you know, EIPP got dissolved and what it came to be transformed to was known as NASP, or North American Synchrophaser Initiative. So now instead of the eastern interconnection only, you have the whole North American power system in your, uh, in your initiative, where it covers the entire United States as well as part of, part of Canada, for example, because we are all interconnected to the Canadian system as well. Now, as a part of NASP, or as an offshoot of NASP, there was this smaller research consortium, which I was a part of, and that was known as PSRC, which has nothing to do with PSERC, by the way. So it's uh, the Power System Research Consortium. Uh, it started in 2006, you know, right at the time I was doing my master's degree in RPI at that time, and then, uh, you know, I got uh, involved with the research over there. So that, this is how it all started from. And the consortium actually is still going on, but, uh, you know, there has been some administrative changes and things like that, which I don't want to go get into. Uh, the consortium had four uh, lead universities, and, you know, Rensselaer was the main, uh, was basically the principal leader of that, of that whole group. And then we have people from Virginia Tech, we had people from University of Wyoming, and we have also had people from Montana Tech, for example, who helped us with the PMU data analysis. And the financial support came from a lot of uh, utility companies like American Electric Power, or AP. Uh, we had several ISOs, ISO New England, New York ISO, and PJM, uh, who were also uh, in the team. And we also had First Energy and uh, I think later, uh, uh, Florida Power and Light and all those people, the Southern Company, uh, they also joined the group, actually. Uh, and uh, one important factor of you know, mentioning this slide is that it's not just the financial support, but you know, these people also provided us with real PMU data from different parts of their territory so that we can have the data and analyze and, and, and make some conclusions out of that data. And since I was from a control, sort of control background, you know, so that's why you know, some of the things which I started looking into is that when you have gigantic amounts of phase measure data or you know in, in some sense it's just uh, output measurements from a huge distrib spatially distributed uh, dynamic system that you have which is your power system how do you, you make use of that data to gain insight about the dynamics of the system right that's all we are trying to do over here and you know this is what also Tom was mentioning that the basic objective of being a PME researcher is that how do you make use of the PME data to gain insight about your power system and since Phaser measurement data are very high resolution data and they can capture the dynamics of the system. So, you know, it makes sense for us to, when we say that we want, want to gain insight about the power system operation, so it makes sense for us to just say that we want to gain insight about the dynamics of the power system. So, so, so some of the things which we started looking into is basically how do you form, uh, how do you identify dynamic models of large power system using synchrophaser data? How do you use those power system models that you created for wide area monitoring? And again, so, some of the things which I'm doing now is basically how do you make use of those models for doing closed loop control? 
So that's probably going to be you know, the major uh, sort of like the outline of what I'm going to talk about. And again, this is a motivational slide. And the reason I kept this slide is that, uh, so this, this uh, picture may be familiar to you guys. So this was New York City before the blackout. And this was New York City after the blackout. And uh, two main take home messages that the 2003 blackout actually taught us is, uh, first of all, you know, uh, the, high the issue of high resolution, right? So basically, it's not enough to just look at SCADA data, where you have measurements, you have one measurement in five seconds or 10 seconds or something like that, right? So it's not just enough to look at steady state data anymore. You have to have some idea about what's going on in your, uh, in your dynamics. And another thing which, the, again, as I mentioned in my previous slide, is that another thing which the 2003 blackout actually taught us is basically this issue of interconnected structure of the entire power system. So for example, you know, if I have a, again, a clustered graph representation of my power system from a dynamics point of view, and uh, you know, we will come back to this picture time and time again, I guess. Uh, so what, we, what I really mean is that uh, if you just focus on what's happening inside your local cluster, then it may not give you a very good idea of you know, what the actual dynamics of the system is, because this cluster is also connected to other clusters. And it's, uh, you know, when I talk to, uh, when I give this presentation to, for example, uh, people who are not really from the power background, I make the analogy of you know, comparing the power system with a Facebook graph, for example, where you have connections of social clusters to each other, and whatever decisions that you make inside a cluster is, absolutely, is going to affect what the dynamics of the other clusters are. right? So that is why this global picture kind of become very important rather than focusing only on local dynamics. And uh, uh, that, that is, you know, those are the two main things that we learned from the 2003 blackout. Now, Given that, so some of the things that we started looking into and the, some of the things you know, which have uh, lots of ramifications over the last few years in my work, for example, is that I want to, I want to identify this global model of, a, of any given power system using phasor measurement data. Okay, so that's like the baseline. That's like the most uh, fundamental way of saying what this research is all about. And traditionally speaking, and actually the Illini professors are very uh, famous for doing this kind of dynamic equivalencing and model reduction of power system tradition, at least like, for example, Peter Sauer, you know, he has done a lot of work on equivalencing of generators at the component levels. And for example, even Joe Chow's previous work was on uh, this coherency identification and things like that. So how do you form equivalent models of this entire cluster using information of each of the agents which are hiding inside it. So that's like the model-based approach for model reduction. But we want to do the measurement-based approach, which means that we do not want to focus on what, the system, what this entire group dynamics actually looks like. We don't want to form that, in, form that model using the information of the individual agents, but we want to uh, form that model using distributed phasor measurements that are scattered around the system in, from some specified buses. So it's an identification problem. Right? We, you have measurement data, and you want to go from measurements to models. But at the same time, it's a model reduction problem, because the model that I, that I want to create are clustered representations of these different groups of uh, generators which are, uh, which are, which are uh, connected in some random way in, in my power system. Now, speaking a little bit more in the power system language, so basically, you know, for the picture over here, uh, the one that I have over here is that, say, for example, if I have a six machine, 30 bus power system, and I know that this system is somehow, you know, can be divided into three broad areas, which means that the tie line reactances of the generators, you know, tying, which are connecting inside the areas are much, much smaller compared to the reactances of the lines which are connecting one area to another. So that's like the sparse representation of the graph that I was showing in the previous slide. So then the question is that, uh, and for example, if I have PMU measurements available from some specified nodes in my system. So for example, if I have, in this case, you know, say for example, I have PMU measurements from three such nodes. Then the question is that, how do I use those measurements? How do I make use, how do I create algorithms by which I can make sense out of those measurements to go from this picture to this picture, where this one is an aggregate of the two, you know, two oscillators that I have over here. This one is an aggregate of the two oscillators that I have over here, and this one is an aggregate of the two oscillators that I have over here. And this intermediate graph, the intermediate topology that you see over here connecting the different equivalent machines is some kind of a reduced interpretation of this very complicated actual network graph that you have. Okay, so this is the problem that I wanted to formulate. So this is basically the, the way of defining the problem. And uh, the way, uh, again, so as I said, the, you know, when you focus on this, this picture, so what you want to do is that you want to make use of those, these PMU measurements to form the dynamic oscillator models of these equivalent systems. And at the same time, you also want to form the, what the equivalent topology connecting these dynamic equivalent clusters actually look like. 
Okay. So it's a twofold problem. So one one is the reduction network reduction problem. Again, uh, and uh, when I say network reduction, you do not want to. Uh, I don't really have the approach of finding the Thevenin equivalent. Like, so for example, some of the work that Peter and Alejandro are probably are doing at uh, at some point of time they were doing, I think, but was to derive the network equivalence using the Thevenin equivalent rules. But my approach is basically a very uh, uh, approximate reduction of just looking at the topological or the graph theoretic properties of the actual network and do the reduction from a graph point of view. And then once you have this actual, you know, reduced other topology present in front of you, then the question is that how do you make use of these PMU measurements to form the equivalent uh, uh, mo dynamic models of your of your clusters. Now, so what I will do is that you know, so let's uh, spend a little bit of time on uh, on some, you know on seeing what how how actually you can solve those kind of problems. And what I will start is that what we call as the one-dimensional models, or what I call as the one-dimensional models. And uh, with the one-dimensional mo the the reason I mention dimension over here is that if you look at the cluster representation or basically the inter-area representation of your power system, so since it's like a radial kind of a structure, so that is the reason I call it one dimension. But you know, you don't really have to call it one dimension, but the ramification, the, the manifestation of that uh, assumption will actually come later. So over here, basically, I have a two-area system that I wanted to illustrate this method with. So you, know, you have a bunch of generators which are coupled to each other by small tie lines on one side. Right, so I'm just showing like you know five of them. They don't have to be five, and they don't have to be in parallel connection. They can be in any random connection, for example. And then you have a bunch of generators which are on the other side. Say, for example, you know, in terms of the uh, WEC system, for example, which we all know about. So this can be a very first-order representation of the Washington cluster and the and the California cluster, for example. And then you have some kind of an equivalent. Uh, I think my pointer is not working, but uh, so you have an equivalent connection which is joining one area to another. And then you have PMU, uh, PMUs placed at the terminal buses of those, of those clusters. And then again, the question is that, how do I make use of those PMU measurements, like the ones that I've written over here? So you have time responses of the voltage magnitude and the phase angles from those representative buses that you have at the, termin at the terminal points of your area. How do you make use of those PMU uh, measurements to go from that picture to this picture? Now. And the battery just died, or? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably just have to use the. Thank you very much. Well, this is the pointer. Nope. That's okay. I'll just probably use the left. Just push the laptop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for the interest of time, I guess. Yep. There you go. Yep. There you go. Okay. So now, when I say that I want to form a, you know, the model of this two-area representation, for example, what do I mean electrically, right? So then we have to go back to our power system analysis classes that we used to take in our undergrads, right? So how do you model the, you know, a very simplified model of the internal dynamics of a generator? Well, you have a voltage source with, you know, constant uh, behind the reactance voltage. Say I call that E1. I call the phase of this guy as say delta one. Then basically you have a salient reactance which lies in series with that voltage source. Typically, what happens is that you also have a transformer which hikes up the voltage from the low voltage side to the high voltage side before it gets uh, you know, before on, the, on the transmission side. So you have the transformer reactants uh, coming as a series over here. And then let's, uh, for example, I call this whole, you know, this series connection and say, for example, the total reactance is x1. Then comes the transmission line reactance, which I call as Xc. And this tie line reactance, reactance is much, much larger compared to the internal reactances of the machines themselves. And then the whole picture kind of repeats on the other side. right? And now once I have this circuit diagram in front of me, then I know again from my power systems analysis scores that the swing equation model, or the dynamic model, the electromechanical dynamics of this two area system actually looks something like this. So this is basically Newton's laws of motion. So it's, it's nothing fancy. right? So we are all aware of, of this dynamics from our 
uh, power system dynamics courses, for example. And then when I say that I want to use PMU measurements to form this two cluster representation, so what I really mean is that I want to use these PMU measurements to identify this each and every parameter which are hiding in this model. So it's not black box identification. You know, I know the structure of my model. I know what the model looks like. I know the order of the system. I know everything. But what I don't know is basically all these parameters which are hiding you know, on the right hand side of this equation. So they are equivalent quantities. I may know each of these, you know, I may know the parameters for each of these machines that I have in the actual system. And but when when I go from the actual full order representation to a reduced order representation, when I'm doing the equivalencing, then basically I have to find out what these equivalent parameters actually mean. Okay, so basically, again, the take-home message over here is that uh, when I say identification, you know, it's. Uh, not black box identification, but it's really, since the structure of the model is known, since the structure of the equivalent system is known, it reduces down to a parameter estimation problem. So basically, I'm, I have to use PMU measurements some way to estimate the equivalent parameters of my, of my, of my reduced order system. And then again, I'm, not, I'm skipping the details uh, in the interest of time, but actually, if you, can, if you go into the details of, uh, if you take a look at this on the right hand side, you will just figure out that ultimately, the parameter estimation problem reduces down to, to the estimation of four essential parameters which are this total reactance that lies on the on the you know on beyond the PMU buses on each of the sides so x1 and x2 and then also the equivalent inertias of these uh, two equivalent machines so these are the four parameters that you want to identify using your phasor measurement unit data okay now how do i do that well, this is a little bit of you know, importance, so that's why I'm spending a little bit more time on that, because I, I think there are students, uh, Tom Orby student, for example, who might be also Alejandro student. Uh, she sent me an email about the, the details of this algorithm. So let me spend a little bit of time in the interest of the audience. So first, let's, uh, let's see how do you uh, uh, estimate the two equivalent reactances, x1 and x2, which lies on either sides of that PMU buses that you have. Okay, so I'm drawing the one line diagram over here, and just for the sake of, uh, you know, just for brevity, I assume that I keep one of the equivalent generators as a reference. So I, I assume that the state of that to be zero, like a slack bus kind of a thing, slack generator. And then uh, the phase difference between the two generators I refer to as delta. So what I do first is that I uh, consider the voltage magnitude of any point which lies at a distance x. So okay, so this x variable is very very important. So let's you know keep track of it. So this x is basically the distance of that point where I'm considering the the uh, the measure of the the voltage magnitude to be from one of the reference points, which I take as the right hand side for in my case. Okay. Now if you assume that the reactance distribution is uniform across the line, so basically you can also assume that x is a indicator of a of a, a geometric distance, right? So for example, if one kilometer is one Henry, then two kilometers is two Henry. So it's an equivalent representation of how, how far this guy is from one end of the, of the line. So I write the voltage phasor expression at that point of uh, at that point in space, you know, where I measure the distance from one of the references, and then uh, you know the representation is a is a in a very nice uh, convex way in the sense that uh, it has a variable called a, where a is the normalized real, normalized distance of that point from the end. So basically, you know, a I define as x divided by x1, xc, and x2. So that's like the, you know, the total reactance of the entire line. As a result of which, you know, a equals to 0 at this point, a equals to 1 at this point, and a lies between 0 and 1 in, in the middle. So again, so these are some logistics, but I still want to spend some time because you know, it's, uh, this a, it actually helps you understand how the algorithm actually works. Uh, then I consider the voltage magnitude at that particular point, and of, of course, that's also a function of this uh, spatial variable a. Right? It depends. The voltage uh, depends on where you consider uh, the point to be, how distant that point is from one end of the line. And once I have the expression for the voltage magnitude, then I consider a small signal change in the in the uh, in the system. So, for example, initially everything was in a state of rest, everything was in equilibrium. Then some kind of small disturbance came in, as a result of which you know this voltage from the equilibrium changed a little bit. And we all know again from our calculus classes is that any change in voltage will be mapped to the change in the state because the voltage is also a, a, a function of this of, the, of this delta, which is the state of the system. So that will be mapped to the change in the state by a Jacobian matrix. And over here, from this equation itself, it just turns out that the Jacobian itself is a function of this A variable, where A represents the distance at which, at, at which you consider the, the, the voltage to be from one end of your line. And let's see how we can make use of this, uh, of this information. 
to satisfy our purpose. What was the purpose? The purpose was to estimate x1 and x2, which are the, the equivalent hypothetical reactances, the equivalent reduced reactances that lies on either sides of these two PMU buses. Now, if I uh, substitute, you know, this, I, I derive the Jacobi expression for the Jacobi, and if I put this back over here and I do a couple of steps, uh, if, if you don't want to follow the steps, that's fine. You know, I still wanted to keep this because I think this one of the students, uh, Alejandro students, actually asked me to. So, uh, uh, if, if you want to, you know, if you want to ignore the math, that's fine. So, just consider this last step. So, finally, by putting those equations back in line and doing a, you know, some some very simple derivations, you actually arrive at this equation. Where on the left hand side, let's spend a little bit of time on the left hand side. So, the left hand side is basically. Uh, the product of two quantities. Uh, the change in voltage after the disturbance happened, there's a change in voltage from the pre-disturbance equilibrium, right? So, the, so that I call as delta V. So this guy is a product of that change times what the voltage magnitude was before the disturbance occurred. Now, if I have a PMU located at that particular point, then both of these guys are available to me, right? Because I have continuous information of data that's coming, coming to me from my PMU. Say, for example, I choose one particular time point, t equals to t star, which I mentioned over here. So if I fix the time, then I know what the change of the voltage at that point of time is from the pre-disturbance equilibrium. And, and I know the pre-disturbance equilibrium as well, because the PMU has been measuring the data all throughout. Yes. Constants, uh, yeah. So what Alejandro is asking is that uh, uh, you know he's asking about excitation system. So basically, the model of the synchronous generators which I chose, uh, I assume that the machine voltage, the voltage behind the reactants, is fixed. But you know, ideally, the E's will also vary because of the excitation dynamics. But the excitation dynamics are so faster in time scales compared to the electromechanical dynamics that I'm interested in. So that's why I assume that they are. They are constant for the time being. I, I'm not. I'm not assuming that they're known. Of course, they are not known. So, not at all. Not at all. Any anything. That's a very important question, and uh, probably I should have clarified that before. This is not working anyway. So yeah, I understand your question. So what Alejandro is saying is that how do I do I have any idea of what this E1, E2, and delta zero is? No, I don't have any idea because my workspace. I should have mentioned this in the previous slide. I don't want to go it because there are lots of clicks involved in there. So my workspace is only the space between the PMUs, and my workspace is only the transmission line. I do not have any idea of what's going on beyond it. Why? Because by my reduction, I have introduced two hypothetical spaces over here. I have no idea how the equivalent machines look like, what their voltages are, what their states are, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But uh, as I said, you know, in, from that equation, since, since the PMUs can measure the current flowing across the line, if you, have, uh, if you have idea about those x1 and x2, you can apply Ohm's law to find out what E1 and E2 are. So that's why I said that E1 and E2 are calculable once you have uh, you know, estimated x1 and x2. Okay? So that's why I didn't keep E1 and E2 as an extra variable to be estimated, because it follows once you have estimates of x1 and x2. Now, uh, again, back to this equation. So what I have is basically a, a, a quantity which I, which I can measure if I have a PMU sitting at that particular geographical location x, you know, distant from one of, the, one of the ends of the system. Then I have an unknown quantity A, which involves these E1, E2, and delta 0. So A is a total unknown over here, as it, which answers Alejandro's question. Then I have a very nice time scale separation structure over here, uh, a time space separation structure over here, which means that you know you have this, uh, you have the a minus a square, which is the dependence on the spatial variable. A was the spatial variable, right? So you have this dependence on a, and then you have the dependence on the state estimate delta t star, for example. So where delta t star is the is the value of the state evolution at t equals to t star. But the nice thing about this separation is that this part doesn't depend on t, and this part doesn't depend on a. So it's there's a you know it's the, the multiplicative problem property actually, as, as, as you will see in the next slide, is very uh, convenient to, to serve our purpose. And uh, again, as, as you know, Alejandro's question was very, very interesting, I think, because uh, it, it kind of makes you think, what are the unknown quantities over here? So A is the unknown, because you don't have any idea about the E's. And delta T star is also unknown, because delta T star is the state evolution, the hypothetical state evolution of the reduced order machines that you have on two sides. And that also is not known to you, because your workspace, again, is the workspace that lies between the PMUs. 
Okay. So now the, then the question is that how do I get rid of this A and this nasty quantities delta T star by making use of this time space separation property? Well, that actually is very simple because the left hand side is known to you once you have a PMU measurement available to you at that point in space. Right? So now I'm writing that equation over here again. And uh, I'm back to my one line diagram. Uh, say, for example, if I have a PMU at bus 2, and bus 2 is basically x2 distance from the from one end. So I form A2. I define A2 in terms of x2 now. So x2 divided by x1 plus xc plus x2. And then I write this equation at bus 2. So when I have Vn of bus 2 equals to that quantity, right? where this A is replaced by A2 now. And Vn bus 2 is known to me because I have a PMU located at bus 2. And I can measure what the changes of voltages are at one point of time and what the predisturbance equilibrium at voltage was, was there at, at that bus at, at that point of time because I have uh, con continuous recording of PMU data. And then I also apply the equation to, uh, this equation to bus number 1. So I define an A1 corresponding to bus number 1, and I write the equation over here. And because of this time space separation property, because this guy was not dependent on t and this guy was not dependent on a, when I take the ratio, then these unknown quantities a and delta t star cancel out. Okay? Which solves, which answers Alejandro's question. That, you know, so these are the two nasty quantities which I absolutely want to get rid of because I don't know what they are. And not just the fact that I don't know what they are, they are also very hypothetical in the sense because they are not physical quantities. You know, I'm just assuming that the reduction has been done. They have been, you know, boiled down to equivalent, equivalent machines and they have equivalent states. They have equivalent voltages and things like that. But they are so non physical uh, that, of course, you don't want to keep them in your system. So basically, when you take the ra ratio, then what remains is that you have these expressions of A's. On on, on the right hand side. These two quantities are known to you because you have PMU measurements at those two particular buses. And then what was the problem that we were trying to solve? We were trying to solve what x1 and x2 are, right? The equivalent reactance is what they are. And x1 and x2 are hiding in the A's, as you can see over here. So this gives you one algebraic equation in solving what x1 and x2 are. But because you have this ratioing business, you lose a measurement. So that's why, you know, if you, since uh, you want to, uh, you have two unknowns over here. So that necessitates that you must have a third measurement somewhere in between where at a lone location. So then you, you know, basically you apply this equation at that third point, the third PMU point, and you get another similar equation over here. And given that, you know, the left hand sides of these two equations are known to you, from the PMU measurements, you just solve uh, these two algebraic equations in terms of x1 and x2 that you have. Why do all this, all this hassle for estimating two parameters? Why, you know, for example, as uh, I think that, that was also a part of Alejandro's question, is that when you have, when I propose the identification problem as a parameter estimation problem, the first thing that should come in, my, come in our mind is that I have measurements, I want to estimate parameters, so why don't I use a least squares or something like that, right? So actually, the, the problem is that you can't. You have to have these kind of a little roundabout you know, ways of uh, estimating your parameters because this is only output, only identification. You, you do not have any idea of what your input to the system is. Okay? Say, for example, a crow sits somewhere in a remote corner of the Washington grid, and you know, the line shots out, and this is some kind of perturbation. But how would you model that effect in terms of an input? And on top of that, how would you model that effect in terms of an inter-area input? Because the identification that you're trying to do is at the reduced model level. So it's very, very difficult to quantify or model the effect of the input to a power system at the inter-area level, as a result of which this input output Output identification techniques like least squares actually are not very applicable for parameter, parameter estimation in this case. So in our model, have I ever made use of any information about what the input to the system was? No. I have only used what the outputs, the Vs, for example, of the system are. And this is why I call it an output-only identification. Yes? How do we get uh, at the known distance because the line 1.22 does not exist really? It's like most of case hypothetic line. That's true. Yeah, how do we get the distance for the point 3? 
Well, for, for when you apply them, actually, well, the distance x1 and x2 are not known to you, so that's what you're identifying. But if you're talking about, for example, this third bus based, be, being placed somewhere over here, you have to have some kind of, again, you know, as I said, the model that I started from has a very radial structure. So it was meant for the WEC models because we had, you know, this, this, uh, this project was actually meant towards the WEC system, actually. So in the WEC system, for example, if you show, if you have that, you know, this five cluster model that I showed, uh, where you have equivalent and representations of lines, then you can get estimates of where you want to place your PMU. For example, if there's a PMU in Malin, which is you know, halfway between Grand Cule and Vincent and things like that, you have to make this first order approximations that the line has a radial structure and that you can approximate those reactances. You know, because in the actual system, yes, you're right. I mean, the, it, things are floating all around, right? So, uh, but if you do want to have some kind of first order approximation, then you have to approximate things like that. Uh, this is a pictorial representation of, of what I've been talking about for the last half an hour, I guess. So basically, you have three measurements at the three buses. And then basically, you have this uh, sort of sign. It's not exactly a sign. It's like a, you know, a times 1 minus a kind of a structure that you're trying to fit through these, uh, through these, uh, through these uh, uh, ordinates that you have at the three buses. And basically, what you're trying to find out by solving those algebraic equations which I showed is that you are trying to find out these, re these, these distances x1 and x2 on both sides of this graph such that this graph ends, you know, starts at this point, ends at this point, and on its way, it encompasses the three ordinates that you have at the three buses, the three voltage measurements that you have at the three buses. So that's an, uh, sort of like a pictorial representation of, of what, uh, what those uh, equations meant. We have two more uh, quantities to estimate. I'll go th uh, very quickly through them. Uh, those are the inertias. Those are much more kind of like a little bit trickier to calculate than the reactances. But uh, it just turns out that uh, uh, for calculating the, you know, if you have two inertias, then you must have two equations because you have two unknowns. Uh, one of the equations actually is given by the, inter the expression for the inter-area frequency. And this is, again, that goes back to Alejandro's question. So if you derive the, what the inter-area frequency or the natural frequency of oscillation of the two-area model, of the two-area system is, using our, uh, you know, undergraduate, undergraduate feedback control course, uh, you will get an expression like this, and all these quantities are known to you except this h, the equivalent h that you have, once you calculate the x1 and x2. Once you know what x1 and x2 are, then you know the current which is being measured by the PMU. You can go back from the v's to the e's uh, using the x1 and x2 that you have okay, by applying AC Ohm's law. Uh, so this gives one equation in the in the equivalent reactances, and the second equation that we used is basically this uh, you know the law of conservation of angular momentum, which uh, reduces down to this kind of an equation. And what this is really saying is that weightier the machine, slower will be the speed, right? So is uh, you know the, the ratio of the inertias actually have an inverse relationship with the ratio of the of the machine uh, machine speeds with a negative sign in front of it, which means that if one of the machines is going in this direction, the other machine is going in the that other direction. So that is why I, that is what I meant by the one-dimensional model. The phase separation is exactly 180 degrees. But then the question is that if this is the second equation that I have for solving my HS, then I must know what my omega one and omega two are. I must know what the you know the the machine speeds are. Well, I don't know what the machine speeds are because as again he said that my workspace is just the the thing that I have between the two PMU buses. I have no idea what's going on behind the two buses because that's what I'm trying to estimate anyways. So then the question is that how do you get omega 1 and omega 2? Well, you can, you have, PMUs also measure frequencies. You know, you have estimates, you have measurements of bus frequencies at those two points that you had. So then again, the question is that if I call those frequencies at X, XC1 and XC2, again, from, uh, you know, by using circuit laws and things like that, you know, if you want to ignore the, uh, the, uh, the equations over there, that's fine. Let's just look at this uh, picture because they are basically saying the same thing. What, uh, what I'm really doing is that I am, uh, I am expressing the two bus frequencies in terms of the generator frequencies from circuit laws. And uh, then you know, this is just one snapshot of what the frequency variation of a space is looking like. So if, if I also consider the temporal variation, then this should be a movie. Like, you know, it's, it's, so this will go up, and this will, you know, in the other instant of time, this will go, go down, then this will go up, and things like that. So this is just one snapshot of time. And it's giving you how the frequency at one point of time is varying spatially from one end of the transfer path to another end of the transfer path. So this is A equals to 0. This, this is A equals to 0. This is A equals to 1. And then you, know, you have this variation of how frequency is varying over the, over the uh, spatial variable at one instant of time. And that also helps you in, in identifying what the omegas are, because you have 
measurements of these bus frequencies at any instant of time. And by using this uh, relationship that you just derived, you can get estimates of what the generator frequencies are looking like at the end of the transfer path. So these are your omega 1 and omega 2. As you put back in that equation, and you get two equations in h1 and h2, and you're all set. Any questions so far? Yes. I, spend, I wanted to spend a little bit of time over here rather than just rushing through it because I think the students, some of the students are here. OK. OK, so I am not a power engineer, so I am a computer scientist. Yeah. One of the issues currently you are talking about is measurements. And uh, when we currently are considering some of the measurements, they can be faulty, they don't arrive. Um, how robust are some of these equations that w when you start to think about more faulty uh, type of measurements, right. are we all, uh, is this particular area also thinking about probabilistic uh, specification of estimations? Well, this is an offline analysis. This, this is, these models are not being estimated in real time. So basically, I have a bunch of data, for example, from the VEX system. And then I have the leverage of spending hours to you know, process that data and things like that. And I'm assuming idealistic situations that you know, there's, I mean, the, the question of delay actually comes, comes in, in, in real time applications, right? So if you want to uh, estimate the model on the fly, then you have to be very careful that the measurement is arriving on time and things like that. But this was only for offline analysis. How robust is this offline analysis that, for example, you don't get very fine granularity, no, 30 do, or actually. 60 uh, samples. Well, I mean, this is 30 samples per second of data, which is enough to capture the bandwidth of the, uh, of the system that you're interested in. So, so if I would go down with the measurement rate, would uh, the interpolation and the estimation suffer? As long as you, uh, you know, you are trying to identify the inter-area dynamics for, you know, which typically for the West Coast power system is in the range of 0.4 to 0.6 hertz. As long as you have, by Shannon's theory, you know, as long as you have measurements which cover this bandwidth, then you're fine. A little bit quickly, you know, this is just a, uh, uh, this is again for the student, I guess, but you know, this is just a simulation example of how uh, the estimates of these uh, reactances, the equivalent reactances and the equivalent uh, uh, inertias come in, but let me just uh, um, go directly into the application. So this is the nice uh, mass spring damper equivalent model of the West Coast power system that we have, and this information was actually given to us by Southern California Edison for which this project was. So you can see this very nice uh, aggregated structure of the VEX system where you have one cluster in the Washington region, you have a huge load cluster in the Los Angeles region, then you have you know, one cluster in the Montana region, for example, in Cold Strip. And uh, Tom actually was talking about uh, this reactive power injection for voltage support at an intermediate point on the Pacific S inner tie. So this is basically the northern part of Berkeley or uh, Moline region, for example, where you have a synchronous condenser. And since a synchronous condenser is a synchronous generator, uh, you actually end up having the intrusion of one swing mode into the system because of this guy. So you have to keep this in your, in your equivalence diagram. And then the question is that if I have uh, PMU measurements from these terminal buses, for example, if I take the two area system of California and Montana, say for example for one disturbance data, for one disturbance I do have measurements uh, from the terminal buses of this system, can I apply these the algorithms that I talked about to identify what these cluster models actually look like? Well, this is the data that we had from Gold Strip, and uh, uh, these are the you know the three those three bus measurement data that I showed. You know the the three buses that I had uh, for for this particular uh, system. But then the question is, then the question is that once you have real PMU data like this, then the question is that what do I do with this data, right? I mean all those fancy calculations, those nice uh, uh, you know voltage stems and all those things that I was talking about. How could you even think about those things when you have actual real data like this? Well, then the answer is that you, know, you have to do data processing. You have to do a lot of pre-processing of the data to bring into the form that you can use it. And uh, first of all, you know, I, I think, again, this was Tom's point, that when you have actual PMU data and there are outliers, you know, the question that you ask, for example, if there are bad data, for example, sometimes the satellite, the GPS loses satellite, you have a bad data, bad data you know, recorded by the PMU, and you see a spike and things like that. So you have to do a mess data massaging. You have to get rid of those uh, outliers and things like that. And uh, again, since you're interested in a very specific kind of oscillation, 
oscillations, which is the interior oscillations. Uh, for our case, we had to design a bandpass filter to separate the oscillations from this. You know, this uh, this quasi steady state behavior actually is because of the governor action. You know, you see this r nice rolling, very very slow kind of quasi steady state properties, which was I think also a part of uh, theoretically speaking that was uh, uh, Sauer and, and Kokodowitz paper at some point of time. This, this nice quasi steady state behavior. Uh, so you want to get rid of that because that's what that's not that's not something that you're interested in. You want oscillations, right? So that's why you have to do filtering to extract out the oscillations. But even if you do oscillations, you have to do one more step. Why? Because in the actual VEX system, if I have a two cluster representation of the VEX system, there are thousands of generators hiding inside this cluster. There are thousands of generators hiding inside this cluster. As a result of which, you know, what you will end up having is the contribution of both local oscillations and the inter-area oscillation in your measurements. And since you're interested only in the inter-area component, as a result of which you have to you have to get rid of the local oscillations, and uh, you apply modal decomposition or eigenvalue realization algorithm or prony analysis and all those things that you know that Dan Tronowski has lots of papers on that. So you have to apply some kind of modal decomposition to get rid of the uh, the local oscillations which you're not interested in and retain only the impulse response of the inter-area mode or the slow mode which is hiding inside this. So that's why you know you see this is like this is not unimodal, right? It has the contribution of many frequencies in it. But once you go through modal decomposition, you see this very nice uh, in sync uh, behavior at the three buses, the voltage oscillations at the three buses, which are uh, unimodal, which represent only one frequency component in it. And uh, so th this is what I mean by, uh, and now, yeah, now you're all set. Now you fix the time at one point. You measure the Vs that I had, you know, those three stems which I showed in my diagram. You measure the Vs at this point. You form your equations and you solve for what the equivalent x1 and x2 looks like, and you, f so, and you form that, uh, that uh, graph you had. And similarly, you can form what h1 and h2 estimates are. Okay. So that's for the uh, that's for the VEX system. Let me just you know I probably should run would run out of time because I uh, uh, I uh, <coughs> took a little bit of time in explaining the algorithm. But I I wanted to keep this uh, slide because then the next question that that you guys are probably going to ask is that why bother about uh, identifying or constructing these inter area models? You know why do I have to what what benefits do I have by calculating these models or developing these models? And the answer is plenty. And uh, this whole b branch of situational awareness, or wide area monitoring, for example, what it means is that you have PMU measurements from arbitrary locations in a very large distributed grid. And then by gathering those measurements, you want to form some kind of performance indices or health metrics that can give you an idea of how your system is doing from a dynamic point of view, how the dynamic health of the system is. is. Uh, uh, how the system is behaving from a dynamic point of view after any disturbance comes in. And for, for those performance metrics, as it turns out, they're very, since you're looking at the inter-area responses of your system and you want to have an idea of how the inter-area health of the system is, uh, is looking like. So those performance metric, metrics are very, very dependent on the inter-area models that you have from the system. So that is the motivation of creating these models because then you, but you can use those models to create the performance indices that you want to, to, to have a, uh, an idea of what your uh, system health is going to look like. Now what kind of performance metrics, and this is a slide for Tom again, uh, the, uh, the, you, know, you can have many performance metrics, but one, of, one very efficient performance metric for transient stability monitoring is uh, what we call the energy functions of the, of the power system. Energy functions have been used traditionally as Lyapunov functions for uh, you know, stability, stability analysis of power systems. I think Pete has used several times in his papers. And over here, if I calculate the energy function for this two area representation of my graph, then I will see that, you know, that the, the, func the, the expression for the energy is highly dependent on the ease. And I'm really glad that Alejandro asked that question because now it's, it's really easy for me to, to formulate what I'm talking about. So they are all dependent on these E's and the deltas where you, your PMUs are sitting at the V's and the thetas, right? So your PMUs, uh, you know, you have access only to the V's and the thetas from your PMU. So how do you go from V and theta to E and delta to co construct these metrics? Well, use the models that I talked about, right? So that actually gives you the way of going from the bus to the generator nodes and create these models. And then once you have the models in front of you at your table, table then you basically use those parameters that you just estimated for the models uh, to create these metrics that you have. Uh, this is a actual real PMU data again. So I'm constructing the bus quantities to the generator quantities over here. So this is a bus phase angle, raw measurement from the PMU. You apply the algorithm, you convert that to the generator angle, the generator, uh, what the generator angle actually looks like. 
uh, and then basically you use the e's and the deltas that you just uh, created out of your algorithm to construct those kinetic and potential energy functions that I wrote in the previous slide. And uh, this is, again, I was mentioning to Tom that you know, if you have a pendulum representation of your two area system, uh, the kinetic and potential energy of a, of a pendulum are all oscillatory quantities. You know, they oscillate very, you know, they're oscillatory, right? But at the same time, they're also 180 degrees phase apart from each other in the, in the classical representation. Now, this is real PMU data. So this is not simulated. Right? Right? This is not something that I did out of my own small fancy models and stuff like that. This is from the actual, this happened in California, you know, five, six years ago and stuff like that. And then one very interesting observation that we had is that uh, this blue color is because of that oscillation in the inter area uh, representation of the kinetic energy. But when you add the kinetic and potential energy up, you get a graph like this. And then the oscillations actually go away, which actually proves that, yes, the, the, the two energies are 180 degrees apart from each other, which is testified by real disturbance data measurement also. And at the same time, the total energy profile has this, you know, this ex exponentially decaying. It's not exactly exponential because it's real data. But you can see that uh, the trend is, uh, is decaying, which uh, means that you have you know, a well-damped system for that particular disturbance event. In, uh, in respect to uh, Dr. Sanders, you know, one point out that I wanted to mention is that you know, National Security Agency was visiting NC State a couple of weeks ago. And I was showing this slide to them also. And then uh, the way I kind of brought in the cybersecurity aspect to it is that if, for example, your PMU data are hacked, right? if the PMU data gets some malicious uh, input or something like that, so your data is corrupted. As a result, your models are corrupted. If your models are corrupted, then the performance indices themselves are corrupted. And for example, if the, the system operator wants to keep this metric as a baseline metric for taking some kind of control action, say, for example, if in the, in the California ISO, if they, if they say that you know, this is my nominal energy profile, and if for any kind of disturbance the total energy goes beyond three megawatt second, then I will take some kind of control action. And as a so, when you have corrupted measurements like that, then you are probably going to get some false alarms, or maybe you know, so it, it depends on the hacker how he wants to manipulate the data. And as a result, he can he can uh, destroy these thresholds or baselines, for example, and get the operator to take some wrong control actions and things like that. Uh, Two-dimensional models, I probably don't have time, but let me just go through again. So basically, when you have a, a, not a two-machine system, two-area system, but a three-area system, for example, then the challenge is that that time-space separation property that I was talking about, you know, that gets lost. And the reason is that now, because you have two inter-area modes, uh, the Jacobian matrix that you had, you know, it, it gets bifurcated into two parts. As a result, when you take the ratio of two voltages, uh, you know, you get an uh, expression like this. I mean, initially, this part was not there because you had only one dominant inter area mode. So these deltas and the A's were canceling, and you're, we were all set. But now you have this extra component that you have, uh, and uh, you are in, in trouble. Four minutes only? OK, so, and the reason, uh, the, the way that you can bypass that problem is that. Uh, in the previous case, I was considering only the voltage magnitude as my output of analysis, right? So I was taking the, volt the ratios of the voltages and stuff. But that's not the only output that you have. I mean, PMUs also measure the phase, for example. So, so why not de you know, derive an e you know, equivalent expression of how the phase is varying over the space, you know, from one end of the tie line to another end of the tie line, and uh, use the phase information, so both voltage and phase information, to get rid of this uh, redundant, uh, uh, this data to contribute, the, the contribution from the other inter area mode, for example, and the Jacob the, the, that uh, you know that sinusoidal Jacobian variation that I saw that I showed in the in the one dimensional case, you know now it becomes sort of like a three dimensional representative of how the Jacobian is varying across each of the branches and stuff like that. So that's about it. Uh, uh, two dimensional models with direct connectivity. So this is uh, uh, again uh, uh, sort of the new ramifications of the problem. Uh, the topology reduction problem, I think Prosper asked about that. So how do you derive the, the equivalent topologies when you have lots of clusters in your system? And this is sort of like a sort of a joint work with Ian Dobson, and we are, you know, it, it's not published yet, so it's under progress. So you can actually apply graph theoretic methods, and you can actually show that uh, the equivalent connections between the areas, uh, you know, the areas and the transmission network, it can be reduced into a bipartite graph. The minimum cover problem for a bipartite graph, for example, which is not an NP hard problem, it's an NP complete problem, and you can show that uh, uh, the PMU placement can be uh, posed in terms of that NP, NP complete problem. Uh, what I'm what I'm trying to show over here is probably again goes back to the work of Sauer, Chow, Peponides. Uh, Kokodovich and stuff like that. So basically, the model-based approach is uh, 
uh, is basically to bring the system in the singular part of form and try to see what the equivalent dynamics is. But again, so what I'm trying to do over here is that once you have the equivalent formulation, then this matrix may not be block diagonal, which means that the inter-area modes that you have in your system may not be decoupled from each other. As a result, when you have lots of clusters, when you have more than two clusters to identify, in your PMU measurements, when you do the modal decomposition, you cannot just select one inter-area mode. You have to you have to do the combined. Com you have to make the com combination of all the inter-area modes taken together. Uh, I can give you details of this in you know uh, later in. Uh, uh, offline, if you want. So again, so over here, I'm trying to uh, trying to say that if the uh, interior modes are very lo loosely coupled, which is also some of the things that people did, uh, then basically the identification problem actually becomes non-unique. And I would be happy to share details of some of the results that we have on, of this non-uniqueness uh, uh, with you guys. Uh, I've done a little bit of work on the PMU placement problem. Uh, I, I think I, I don't really have time to explain the PMU placement problem very now. You know, so again, the motivation is that how do you choose the best points of uh, choosing the P if you have lots of PMU data, as Tom was mentioning. So everything is very redundant. So how do you choose the optimal set of PMU data that you want, would want to use, especially if the PMU data is unreliable and noisy, uh, to have best estimates of your uh, model? Uh, this is my new project, uh, which I have the wide area control problem. Uh, again, so the, I, just give me one minute. I mean, you know, this is very important. So, and especially for Alejandro, I think. So, I wanted to explain this to him. So, the wide area control problem actually is uh, germinating from the wide area modeling problem, which means that, say, for example, I have a complicated power system graph as here. Uh, then, by applying these clustering techniques and things like that, I go from this representation to uh, this, you know, like a three area equivalent representation. And then, what the wide area control problem is, is that, say, for example, if you want to, uh, if you design a controller for this reduced order system uh, in order to make sure that the oscillations between these equivalent machines, you know, follow some kind of desired trajectories and things like that. So that's an undergraduate control problem. Right? That's really not, there's nothing fancy about it. I mean, you can just do it by root locus and stuff like that. But then the problem is that you can't stop at that point, because if you design a controller for the reduced order system, that controller is very hypothetical. These clusters don't exist in reality. If I say that I will go to Washington and touch the equivalent generator there, that doesn't make any sense. Because if I go to Washington, I'll still be seeing all these actual generators in reality. right? So then the wide area control problem really is that you design, you do a control design in your reduced space, but then how do you map it back to the actual distributed control or distributed generators that you have in your actual system such that the inter area response of the full of the full system is somewhat in agreement or in order of epsilon close to the inter machine response that you have from the reduced order system okay so that's that's really a control inversion problem and i can again i can give uh, details later uh, this these slides were actually for bill sanders so you know the the way i problem the the, the way i pose the uh, cyber physical applications of uh, in, in the WAMS technology is really uh, a departure of uh, centralized computation to distributed computation using PMUs. And let me just uh, skip those things, and maybe I'll talk to you later. Uh, this is a joint work with Cisco and RENSI, which is Renesa Computing Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. And so basically, you can actually show that instead of using one super PDC, which is doing all the computation at TVA, for example, if you if you distribute these PDCs into different hierarchical, hierarchical levels, you can form very nice optimization algorithms uh, by which you want to uh, you know, optimize the, uh, the data exchange rules and also the topology of communication, the network graph, for example, so that you get uh, clo you know, the result that you get out of the distributed estimation is somewhat closer to the centralized estimation. So that is how I uh, formulate the, uh, the cyber physical problem. This is the, the last slide. I guess you know, this is my lab. Uh, where I have uh, a glimpse of my lab, basically. So we have, uh, you know, we have a multi-vendor PMU test bench where we have PMUs from Schweitzer. We have PMUs from ABB. ABB is just in our campus. So they're very close to us. They're our neighbors. Uh, we have PMUs from Arbiter and also from National Instruments. Uh, so right now, we are in the process of doing this multi-vendor calibration testing and things like that. So that's some of the things that we are trying to do. We also have two racks of RTDS, and we are getting two more racks. Uh, and uh, we have a SCE project where we are basically you know, integrating the RTDS with the PMUs to form VEC models and doing model validation for them. Uh, this is another uh, very interesting facility that we have. This is not mine. This is uh, this belongs to Subhashish Bhattacharya of the Freedom Center. So this is uh, uh, this is an RTDS for one part of the New York power system where it emulates uh, a three mesh, a three bus system for Marcy, uh, Cooper's Corner, and New Scotland. And I have put uh, uh, National Instruments PMUs in there to to do some monitoring and things like that. 
So conclusions, I guess, you know, these are very typical, very general conclusions that the wide area measurement uh, system technology is, of course, very important for the smart grid researchers. It uh, can, you can formulate various levels of or various ranges of research problems out of this technology. Uh, cyber physical, cyber security is, of course, very, very important. And I think number five is very important, especially, uh, you know, I was, I was showing this slide when, when I met Kate, you know, like six, seven months ago in the ISGT or something. And then while some of the students, actually, they were all Tom Overby students at that time. So they came up and they said that, you know, we are very interested in mathematics. We are, uh, we are all, you know, inclined towards differential equations. We dream about eigenvalues and stuff like that. But we also want to formulate problems in power systems where we can apply these techniques and still be referred to as smart grid researchers. So how do we do that? So I think this presentation was at least a partial answer to that question that, yes, if you are mathematically inclined, then there are infinite number of uh, research problems that you can do as a PhD student you know, and still be referred to as a smart grid researcher and not just a mathematician. And uh, of course, last but not the least, I think I'm, I'm very grateful to uh, the financial support provided to me by uh, National Science Foundation and Southern California Edison. And uh, uh, real PMU data and software were provided by SCE, Bonneville Power Administration, and Electric Power Group. Uh, thank you very much. This is my homepage if you're interested in, in knowing more about my research. And this is also the website for my uh, PMU lab. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, Aranya, very interesting. Thank you for uh, coming here and giving us this talk. Yeah. One thing that bothers me, I know you're trying to make a cybersecurity connection, so we don't have a man in the middle, but you have created a PMU in the middle. And that, that third PMU bothers me in your two-bus uh -huh. equivalent example. Since you have these two machines in series, Yes. Do you really need X1 and that's, X2? That, that's an excellent point. So what Pete is asking is that the third PMU that I have, I can, I, do I need an actual measurement unit over there, or can I just calculate by Ohm's law, right? Because I know the current, I know have the voltages and stuff like that. If you have a radial structure, yes, you do not need the third PMU. But for example, in the actual VEX system, as Prosper was saying, if you have a very distributed structure where things are flying out here and there, and the 500 kV line infrastructure is not exactly radial, then it's better probably to have an actual measurement rather than calculation. Yeah. Well, I was referring only to your two machine equivalent. Yes. Those two are in series. So yes. why do you need X1 and X2? Don't you just need the total? And so you could you don't really need X1 that is, and That X2. is true. If, you, if, your objective, if your objective is to form the energy functions where X1 and X2 was being lumped as one, right? So you just need the total. Yes, you are. You are absolutely. But uh, if you really want to have some perspective of what is going on, in one, each of the regions, then yes, then I would say that X1 and X2 and H1 and H2 are needed. Yeah, but for your for your single swing equation, I think all you, you just need, need one. Yeah, 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 you just need the total. Yeah, uh, I have a question to ask you. Yes. Uh, can you sh can you share with us the reason why, uh, in way to, to do the validation, you used the WEC system? Yes. And uh, the sub question is: uh, Can you tell us the challenges for us to? Uh, model the Western or the Eastern very interconnected system mm. in a way to use the PMU data. How do you do model validation? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, how we can do the cluster for the mid, you know. Oh, oh how can we extend these methods for the EI? Yes. There is no definite answer, very honestly, uh, because as I said you know, in our conversation that the Eastern interconnection has a very spaghetti structure. It's highly distributed. It has no structure at all, actually. So if you want to do a model, a reduced model inter interpretation inside the state of Illinois by using PMU data from five different locations or five different transmission substations in Illinois, then basically what you have to start is that, as I said, you, know, you, have, you have PMU data. First, of, first and foremost, as the model reduction guys actually did, but over here, my approach is to use measurement-based approaches and not model-based approaches. The first and foremost thing that you need to do is that you pass the PMU data through a model decomposition software, and you see how many slow modes that you get, how many, how many clusters or how many pockets that you have inside the state of Illinois, for example. And of course, you have, the utility company has to provide you with a transmission network map, and some of these things are very arbitrary that, you know, how you select the, the different clusters and things like that. For the VEX system, we were in luck because History and experience has told the VEX people that traditionally the VEX system can be modeled as this very nicely structured 
you know, mass spring damper kind of a system where you have five clusters and things like that. So we started from the reduced starter interpretation, and then we did the model model uh, uh, model estimation or the model identification. So that we were in luck in that, in that way. But if you do not have any idea of how your system structure looks like at the inter area level, then yes, you have to go through all those steps to to form the structure first, and then use the estimation techniques. There's really no one single answer to that, and so. Okay, well, let's thank uh, you thank again. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you here. Bye.